Are we going to get a break for oh, dinner? Okay. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. I'm Taylor Sharp with uh, Thought Maker Pro uh, Group Dallas Chapter. I'm a co coordinator with Dennis Burnham, who Dennis Burnham is going to be our presenter today on Thought Maker User Interface Design, or design as a whole, not just user interface, but he's going to give us a presentation on that. So he is quite the expert in that field, and so I'm really looking forward to that pres uh, presentation. So a reminder, those of you in the DTS group, we have a meeting Tuesday night at 6.30 at my place uh, to discuss some of the things that will be presented that day. And as Dr. Will reminded us, March 30th is Pause on Air in St. Louis, uh, an expensive way to get with some other advanced developers to learn uh, more FileMaker advanced things. So for that, check that out. I think that covers our announcements for this month, other than... Uh, next month, next, what you're presenting? Uh, yes, next month, assuming Claire's Connect is out, I'm presenting with Javi and Mike Wallace. So, uh, assuming Claire's Connect is out. If it's not, I'll be doing a probably for best professional practices, but anyway, Javi and Mike and I have to get together and prepare for, for next month. So we, Hopefully we'll have a Claire's Connect presentation assuming that product is released. So, it should be exciting. Okay, without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Mr. Burnham. Thank you. <laughs> um, let me just begin by saying that I'm going to try to talk softly. Um, after last month's meeting where it was our first time here, um, we came down and met with the restaurant owner asked him to consider putting some sound baffling in the room and we're not the only ones who've asked for it so I'm hoping we can look forward to that so that the shouting doesn't cause a lot of an echo. Uh, today we're going to talk about what I know about design. Uh, a few of my colleagues here in the Dallas area think that my design is spectacular. I'm not sure I deserve that reputation. Uh, you can judge for yourself when I show you some examples of what I do. But I really consider FileMaker uh, designed to be a very important part of uh, the work we do. Uh, all too often we're focusing on the technical things with code. That's, this is a microphone. <laughs> when you get here in uh, two months from now, you'll wear one. So the, the creative side of what we do gives me sort of a balance in the work that I do of the right brain, left brain uh, work, half of it being the coding and the technical things and writing calculations, the rest of it being the user interface. So I hope that some of the things that I'm going to show you today will be new to you. And if you pick up just a few things that are new, then I hope it'll be worthwhile. I've given you some uh, of an outline of what we're covering. So if you have questions about a particular one of these things that you want to go back to during Q&A at the end, uh, we can do that. So you, all, you, you do have some of you are connected. You'll be able to see things close up on your own screen. Um, so good user interface is about simplicity and common sense and making something that was otherwise chaotic uh, very ordered. Uh, in my opinion, that advice doesn't necessarily apply to the work that we do in FileMaker. Working design in FileMaker is quite a different thing from doing brochures or uh, even websites where there's a different way that you have to structure your consistency. Um, in FileMaker, what you do for one client may be totally different from what you do for another. So it's kind of tempting to say that user interface isn't everything, but at least for today, it is. Now, what, you have to begin by realizing that your app is in the hands of your users, and that's all they ever see. You can be the most masterful code writer and script writer and, and recursive functions or whatever you do to make things work. They never see that. They only see the user interface that you create for them. About 13 years ago, uh, the whole game changed when iOS came out. And it's my view that that's when the marketplace began to expect from us uh, a higher level of uh, quality and design than the kind of database things that we did in the 1980s and 90s, where everything was just a bunch of rectangular boxes on the screen. Uh, and they navigated their way around. Once the apps came into the world, uh, users got their hands on things that actually looked real pretty. 
and it raised the bar of what we have to do. So very often I find that customers are not interested in spending money just to have it look good. They'll tell you that database works great, what do I need it to look good for? Uh, and you can make an effective case for how good design will improve worker productivity, it'll improve uh, morale, and when there's turnover in a company and new people come aboard, it will cost a company a lot less to train new people in their system if the user interface is intuitive and, and well organized, people will jump into it more quickly. Um, another thing that plays into the ROI of good design is that if you're building this as an asset for a company and somebody decides they want to sell the company someday, they're handing over to a new owner something that has a lot more value if the user interface has all those qualities to it. So, I want to mention a little bit about starter solutions because they have pros and cons. Uh, obviously, they're easy. People get their hands on them and they're free. Um, I always encourage people to try a starter solution uh, and then they'll come back for custom work because the starter solution never has everything they want. And what they do get out of using the starter solution is a little bit of experience with finding and sorting and you know, what database should look like. The starter solutions look okay, but they'll almost never be what your customer wants. So it doesn't hurt to let somebody play with one. It'll never be adequate for what they really want. And if it is, then you don't belong there anyway. Uh, at best, you might get a referral to somebody else, but the custom work they need will bring them back to you. So here's an example of the kind of work that I didn't mean to go ahead. Um, when when a, what they call a citizen developer creates something. Uh, this is the, the actual database of a former client of mine in um, Dallas who loves his database. And he loves the fact that he has his hands on it. And I think that maybe when he was a child, he was not allowed to play with crayons and now he can. But over time, he's had to develop it further. So my theory is that there's something called layout creep. And you can experience this when you look at somebody's work and you see that the upper left hand, the, like the northwest quadrant, is where the work began. And over time, what happened was that they took something that was in, in that corner, it was at that time the whole screen, and then they added something over on the side when they decided to make some buttons, and that wasn't enough, so they expanded a little bit more, and maybe they bought some larger monitors for all their employees, and that wasn't enough, so now they added a uh, thing at the bottom, and that wasn't enough, so then they added even more. And as a developer, I come in and I look at that and I say, please, let, let me build you something that looks good. Oh, no, 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 our people love it. When I'm on my way to the men's room passing by, their employees say to me, please make, get us something better because they hate it. They, they, nobody knows what button to push, but once they've memorized where it is, I suppose they feel like they know it. The only thing I could persuade him to do was let me give him this. So I gave him a main menu and I put a few report buttons on the right and that big button in the middle that says enter FileMaker takes him right back to that thing that I just showed you. And that's when I lost the client. Happily for me. I would rather always start with a clean slate when there's nothing that I'm inheriting from the past and I can uh, work with the customer and learn what their business is about and, and figure it out step by step. And that's where the planning really begins. So this is an example of something that started for a, um, a Dallas company that runs dental and vision clinics in Mexico. And I feel like there's always a need for a home page. People are familiar with that from websites. With apps, it's a little bit different on your phone. They always open with something like a splash screen. You don't really need a splash screen when you're working uh, on the desktop. So giving them something that was attractive and familiar to them, a photograph that they recognized from their website, allowed me to build a little bit of space around it that I can change over time. But it's a place where at least everybody opens up the database and that's what they see. 
today I've got a few famous quotes that I'll share with you. This one I like because it talks about the simplicity versus the complication. Um, you, can, you can write a script and, and run it and then you can call it done and you can define a field and you can test a calculation in your data viewer but there's no way to ever be certain that the look and feel is actually done. It almost is never done. You can tweak it endlessly because it's subjective. What appeals to you may not appeal to every user. Um, I know that something I'm guilty of in the work that I do is putting too much on a layout. When I look at the work that Will does in WebDirect, I'm partially jealous of it, envious of it, because it's beautiful and it's the opposite of the way that I do it. <laughs> exactly. And, and so there's not, my way of doing it isn't necessarily what will appeal to you. So I want to begin going through a number of the design elements and tools that FileMaker gives us. And the first one is navigation parts. We got navigation parts in a recent version, and the reason that this uh, came about was because it solved the problem of people pinching and zooming on their tablets and phones. Because when you do that on something that was in your header area, only a portion of the header be remained visible, and if there were buttons that they needed access to, they became out of view. So the navigation part has the feature that it doesn't change size when any zooming occurs in or out. And it's a very handy place to hide, uh, to place certain things that would be invisible in either print or preview. And my favorite is the continue button, because the, that little button that used to be blue and now it's clear uh, disappears when somebody is in preview or, and, and they go to print. But often you're in a script where you need a continue button. So the navigation part is a handy thing because it doesn't show up in preview or print. It only shows up in browse mode. Uh, I'll show you in a little while there's another kind of thing I can do in the navigation part that's a record navigator. What I like about button bars is that they give you a consistency of size and color uh, and behavior. And it's really easy, if things change, to add or delete segments. Um, they can be buttons, they can be popover buttons, uh, or they could be nothing at all. And if you learn how to give them names and apply styles to them, it becomes easier to work with them in the layout object uh, navigator that we'll talk about in a little bit. One thing to be careful about is if you copy and paste a button bar from one layout to another, whatever you've written into the code for that button bar is not necessarily going to work on another layout. So there's a danger to copy and paste. And I know that one of the requested features that I've heard about over the years is to have the uh, navigation part be consistent throughout the whole uh, database, but we don't have that yet. That's just something we hopefully can look forward to. There's also a way to use vertical button bars. And I tend to go to a vertical button bar if the buttons have text in them that tends to make it too wide to fit on the, the width of your screen. Uh, and it ends up being a two-line piece of text and it starts to look disjointed because not every button has the same text. But if you make vertical button bars, then you can have as much room as you need for the widest element and you can add the vertical ones as you need to also. Um, there's a thing I'm going to show you in a little bit that's um, based upon tooltips of a way to use the vertical button bars to create what's called a sliding drawer where you're cursor hovers over it and something uh, pops out. Dynamic window size layouts is something I spend too much time doing, but it's really important. Uh, you've got so many different users with different size monitors, so one of the things you have to do with a new client when you're starting fresh is sort of take a census of what do they got in their office. Is everybody using the same display? How many people have twin displays or even three. And if you can standardize what you're doing so that it will work on everybody's screen, 
you're saving the client money. Now, of course, if they want to go whole hog on it and, and have everybody's screen be different, there's a lot of work you're going to do and get compensated for that. I find that the tablet is often the best place to start because the 1024 by 768 aspect ratio of an iPad works nicely on most desktop systems. So you can at least introduce somebody to mobile devices and desktop without having to uh, double the cost of getting them into it. Of course, with the phones, and I'll get into that a little bit later, uh, that's different. Um, where's Taylor? You remember this example where we, we built something for Steve where there was an iMac on his desk, and all the work we did was designed to fit on a 27-inch iMac, which everyone in the company had. Three months later, he came back to the guy's office and we find that he bought himself a laptop and the laptop is on his desk and he's got a new, different size display running off that laptop. Remember? Now, um, I tried to look up this morning, who is Robin Matthews? And it, Robin Matthews either played third base for the Chicago Cubs or was a, an English poet but he's credited with this clever saying, which I like. Um, and I think it's especially true of FileMaker because as I said before, a lot of your work is done on the technical scientific side where you're doing arithmetic and writing calculations and, and writing code in your scripts. But here is where the art uh, comes in. I found recently that there are differences in Windows and Macintosh when it comes to the get window width function. Uh, so you want to be aware of that because a few extra pixels on the Windows machines that make room for the scroll bar, even if the scroll bar is not visible, uh, cause the window behavior to change. So you, you've got to take hold of the, the differences 17 pixels seems to be the additional amount that intrudes into the navigation part on the Mac, but gets added to the navigation part on Windows. And also I found that when I was testing this on, uh, on a Windows server, using FileMaker Pro 18 on a Windows server, it was totally different because of course Windows server is not one of the supported uh, applications for FileMaker Pro. Uh, but there, there was a whole blue thing around the frame, just like in the old days before we got the new uh, windows that are cut off right at the edge. So because of that nuisance, what I wrote here was a, a, um, a function that said if the platform uh, is, I can't even read my own thing there, but it had detected whether or not it's windows uh, or not, and then it would add or subtract uh, from the window width when changing layouts. And something like that is very handy to turn into a custom function because then you don't have to remember the arithmetic every time you want to use it. And you can import the custom functions from one database to another. So I really love custom functions and I know there are some people in this room who hate custom functions, uh, but I find them especially for design really, really useful. Um, another example that I do with custom functions is uh, to have something that is visible only to people with full access. So I can have objects on the layout that I don't have to worry about other people seeing because if, unless they have full access, it'll be hidden from them. Um, the, say that again? A popover, right. Anything that you want to see can be put in that popover. This custom function that I have on the screen is one that I use whenever I'm dealing with telephone numbers. So that whenever somebody exits a field that's a phone number field, it'll automatically format into whatever their preferred um, format is for phone numbers. You want Greg to repeat the question? Oh. <laughs> Um, this is a very complicated thing that I did with custom functions. It's a solution I've been working on for years where uh, various scores have to be reported in different columns. And the same thing is happening layout after layout after layout. 
So rather than have to go on each layout and set the hide and show properties on each field, I simply have a custom function for column one, column two, three, four, and so on. And then once that custom function is applied, if, God forbid, a change had to be made to the hide and show, I only have to make it in one place in the custom function, and it applies everywhere. Uh, similarly, if you have scripts that have calculations in them, um, whatever it might be, a currency exchange or a weather uh, calculation, um, if you find it necessary to change that calculation because something was wrong, you would have to go through, find wherever in your scripts that's used. If it's put in as a custom function, you don't have to worry about where it's used. It'll, one correction will change it everywhere. Um, the status area is something that I like to keep hidden as much as possible. And sometimes I run into the difficulty of a customer who has used FileMaker and they're accustomed to the status area. My feeling is that the only thing they really, really need in the status area is the record navigator. So it's very easy to give them a record navigator like you see in the lower left, and you can place that in the header part or the navigation part and try to keep that status area closed. Uh, anything that they need in terms of buttons, you can make for them in scripts. And keeping the status area closed keeps them out of trouble. It also makes the app look a lot better on the screen. It doesn't have that unnecessary uh, technical looking thing at the top. Now, almost every app that I do these days has some kind of a control panel that I give to the customer so that they have some control over the way their database operates. Uh, it may be that there's a list of employees that they need to change from time to time or a list of uh, their inventory or things that you don't really want as a developer to have to come in and modify. And if they're the th sort of things that aren't used on a daily basis, they don't belong in the regular set of layouts that the users have to see. So if there's a control panel layout somewhere, then anybody who has the permission to use it can get in there and make the kind of changes that, that are necessary. Gives them a feeling of control. So we're going to talk a little bit now about fonts and type. I had a, um, a friend in Seattle who I found when we were both on a, a task force committee and we were talking about fonts and I made the remark that when I go to the movies and the titles are running, that's my opportunity to spec what is that font. Um, I'm out of practice with it compared to what I used to do, but um, this guy Tom raised his hand and said, I did the same thing. And, <laughs> We became known as the, the, the two geeks on the committee because who goes to the movies to look at fonts? But the, whoever works for the uh, production company that makes those titles puts a lot of con effort and, and um, care into what fonts do they choose for the movie. It's almost as important as the costume designer, at least it is to them. So when it comes to fonts in FileMaker, we have what uh, Nick Orr came up with about uh, I guess it's 14 years ago, the fonts that he called cross-platform, and that's far out of date now. For a long time, I've found that Tahoma was a preferred font for any cross-platform work because the metrics in that font are identical on Windows and Mac. Problem is that unless somebody has Microsoft Office installed, they don't have Tahoma. So I started to work on a list of What's that? Oh, I'm just clearing. oh, clearing your throat. You want a microphone so that you can... <laughs> so I tried to come up with what is a, a, a list of the fonts that are uh, cross-platform and pre-installed on the device, because we now have to concern ourselves with Windows, Mac, and iOS. And except for the mistake on this slide where in Arial I only have bold italic, it actually is uh, all four uh, versions of Ariel, the, the bold, the bold italic, and uh, regular. But this group of fonts that you see on the right side are the only ones today that are pre-installed on the devices and work cross-platform. So sticking to those is 
helpful to avoid the kind of problems where something looks different on somebody's computer. Do any of those have metrics that are slightly like telephone? No, they're all slightly different. Uh, so sometimes when you're working on for the Windows uh, person, even though the font exists on the computer, you may have to make sure that fields are a little bit wider to make sure that the font is not cut off. Um, searching for the fonts in a database is a challenge too. Um, a few weeks ago I did some investigation to find out what are those three parts that appear in the drop-down list of fonts and I found that the first, one at the top are the five most recently used fonts. The second section is all the fonts that are on the layout that you're on and the third section is everything else that's available on your machine. If you were working with Adobe software, you would have this wonderful tool for finding fonts. And not only find, but find and replace. So if you had a document that was like a 80-page catalog and you wanted to change Avenir to Arial, you'd be able to do it in one keystroke. In FileMaker, it's a real challenge to be able to go through your whole database and find where fonts are used and change them. So the best possible thing you can use is the one that's in the middle, fonts in the current, uh, it says on the screen fonts in current file. I'm not sure whether that's the current file or the current layout, but in any event, when you're on a layout, if you see more fonts than the ones that are in that middle section, those are the ones that you might want to change so that you're, you're not giving somebody a file that requires fonts that are not expected. And of course, you'd have to go layout by layout to do that because FileMaker hasn't given us a tool similar to Adobe. Um, I rely on some other tools. Yes, Will? This is in our, is this working? Yeah, it's working. This is an argument for the use of styles. If you set your styles off carefully from the beginning and set your default font, you can later change everything. 412 layouts. You'll be glad to know that I'm coming to Styles soon. <laughs> so some of the tools that I use for fonts are Suitcase is my favorite font manager. Uh, I prefer it to Fontbook, but in the Macintosh we all have Fontbook. I don't know what people have on Windows. What do you have on Windows, Will, to control fonts? We just get 47,000 fonts uh -huh. by default. <laughs> um, I also like to use Font Doctor and Font Finagler. Both of those have the ability to do things like clear your font cache or detect when you have fonts that are corrupt. Um, I'm a big fan of Developer Assistant. Uh, Developer Assistant is just a, a great time saver whether you're doing coding work or design work. Um, default Folder is a wonderful Mac utility for organizing where your things are. And Text Expander is a favorite of mine for uh, snippets of text that you want to repeat. So a lot of the get functions that I have to type over and over again, uh, or any other things in, in working with scripts, I use Text Expander. Uh, for character options, there are some interesting new things you can use, like emojis and symbols, arrows, bullets, dingbats. So this is an example of a system that I built recently for somebody who teaches uh, bridge. And um, it was much easier to use the keystroke for the four suits than it was to start working with a, an actual graphic object. But you have to be careful because not all of these things exist on cross-platform. For instance, the emojis are great on the Mac. Uh, I had one client who needed flags of the world, and every flag of the world is in the list of emojis. But on Windows, they show up as a little dot. So you have um, various character options that you can find in your emoji list. Uh, in this case, it's dominoes that I have on the screen. But there, many times you'll find that the thing you want isn't a graphic at all. It's a keystroke. This is a... Um, thing I call the periodic table of typefaces. And while it's cute in the way that it, uh, it imitates uh, chemistry, uh, it's also a very good way to take a quick glance at what certain fonts look like. Um, I used to work in the design world, in the graphic publishing, and I had this Adobe book of fonts next to me all day long. 
uh, and it was a valuable tool. I couldn't have done my work without it. And over time, uh, I began to memorize, you know, which font uh, I wanted to use. And there are some differences. You know, you'll find the, the capital M sometimes only goes part way down in, in a font like Bank Gothic. In other fonts, it goes all the way down to the baseline. Um, there's a really wonderful film that you can uh, rent uh, either from Amazon Prime or Vimeo, and it's called Helvetica. It was made in 2007, which was the 50th anniversary of Helvetica. Um, Helvetica was, is thought of as the last really important font because after uh, computers came around, it became much easier for font developers and designers to create many, many more fonts than existed in the past. But this movie is a great way to learn a little bit about the history of how font design changed from the Art Nouveau days in the 1920s and, and in World War II and Helvetica, of course, in the 50s. Uh, when John Lindsay was the mayor of New York, he had the entire subway map uh, redesigned in Helvetica. So if you go to New York today and you see all those circular uh, symbols on the buses and the subway lines, you know, it's either a number or a capital letter in a simple circle, and, and all the maps and all the literature is all done in Helvetica. Uh, it's used by Verizon, it's used by American Airlines, it's used by Linotype. You'll see Helvetica all over the place, so it's, it's really dominant. And the movie's fun. It's only an hour and a half. Um, the difference between serif and sans serif fonts has changed a lot. It used to be that the rule was that headlines used sans serif types and body text used serifs. And the thinking was that it's those little feet at the bottom of the letter that somehow guide the eye toward easy reading. And that turns out to be still true for things like newspaper columns, where people who are speed readers can read a column vertically instead of their eyes going back and forth. And the thing that helps them do that is the serif. But the more current thinking about it is it doesn't really matter that much. So in FileMaker, I tend to use serifs when there's some sort of a, a bolder um, uh, caption or headline over something else. And if there are fields that contain lengthy portions of text, you can, if you want to, use uh, a serif alphabet for that. But it isn't as necessary as people used to think it. Um, here are some examples of combinations of serif and sans serif on this business card for a company that used the serifs for their name and the sans serif for the, uh, the subheading, which is sort of the opposite of the old way. Spotify changed from a serif to a sans serif recently. Yahoo made a change also from a serif to a sans serif. Um, the font that they used for the, the one on the bottom is called uh, Optima. And you may have seen Optima in your alphabet. What's nice about Optima is that it has little curves at the bottom of each letter that's kind of like a serif because it's not absolutely straight like sans serif alphabets. Uh, here's a bank that went also from uh, serifs to sans serif. Uh, if you look at the capital C on the one on the left, you'll see that it has, I, I don't, forget what that thing is called at the top of the C, that, um, that vertical line. Some alphabets will have it on both the top and the bottom of the letter C, and that's one way that you can uh, use to recognize what font it is if you had to recreate it. And also, you know, Google made a change. Uh, a letter that's very easily distinguishable is the lowercase g. In most alphabets, it is different in serif than it is in sans serif, and obviously you can see that here. Uh, Adobe and Apple have different tools for working with alphabets um, and, and graphics. In Adobe, you can get by with Illustrator, Photoshop, or Fireworks. Fireworks is a little bit uh, lighter weight than Photoshop. It doesn't offer you as many of the photographic changes, but it's really good for uh, creating things like icons that you might need. And uh, Apple gives us preview, which is just wonderful for quickly looking at something or changing the size of an object. So rather than putting a high resolution image into your file, if you 
don't have any of the more expensive tools, if you have Apple Preview, you can open it up and change the resolution there, save it out, and then put it into FileMaker. Or you can change something from a JPEG to a PNG if you find that you prefer the way that looks. Um, Text Wrangler no longer exists. It was acquired by Barebones. So the important thing to know about these text editing tools is that now we need 64-bit applications. And Text Wrangler never became a 64-bit. So if you still have an older version of it, it's not going to run on the newer Macs and the newer Windows machines. Master Detail is a layout concept that um, we got in, I don't remember, was it 17 or 18, where we got the ability to make a portal that is um, pointed to the current found set. Uh, what's nice about it is that you don't have to create a table occurrence in order to have that portal in operation on the layout. And I find that half of the people don't really get the fact that when there's a found set that is not the entire uh, set of data, and they're only looking at four things in the portal, and they wonder, where are all the others? So you give them a button somewhere that goes back to show all, or you give them a button that will filter the portal somehow by performing a find that they don't really know is a find, but you've scripted it into a button uh, that will do that for them. Yes? Yeah, so a find button obviously is extremely important, but I think it's crucial for all of our list layouts to have prominently displayed something that says something like showing 17, of, 17 records out of a total of 9,000 or whatever. So that just, we, we usually hide our, our status uh, toolbars for our users, but if they show them, they can see that up there in the upper left. Uh, and it's necessary for us to recreate that, and it's easy to do. Uh, right. The record navigator that I showed a little bit earlier is an example of that, because not only do you, can you put the buttons that go to the next, or go to the first, or go to the last, or the I, previous. I've actually gotten to the point now where if there are no records in the found set, I'll hide the portal and show a button that says, there are no records in the found set. There are 17,000 records in this table. Click this button to do a find. And another thing I like to do in the portal is use a conditional format to highlight whatever is the current record they're looking at. So it just confirms that the one that they want. It, of course, what's nice about the new uh, portals is that any click on a record in that portal will automatically make that the current record. But the conditional formatting at least confirms to them that their click did something. Yes. It's easier now because some of the things we do with it, like finding and sorting, are sort of built in, and you don't have to create a table occurrence for it. All right, so now we come to one of my favorite new features, which is the layout objects palette. Probably the best new feature... I'll wait for these guys to come in the door. I kind of think that this um, layout palette evolved out of everybody requesting some kind of layering. Because until we had this, you had the ability to bring something forward or to the front or send something to the back or backward. And it, it was a nightmare if you had to move things around a lot. Um, now that this is a common tool, it's one of those things where you wonder, how did I ever live without this? Um, it, it's, it's so valuable. Um, the engineers did a great job of it, but there's still a few weaknesses in it. Um, sometimes when you take hold of something and you want to drag it up or down, it resists going to where you want it to go. And I found that in order to overcome that, learn the keystrokes for forward and backward and watch it move in the palette when you hit that keystroke. Um, another thing is you cannot move something into a group. 
you can ungroup something and then put something in its position and then regroup it. Um, so what I tend to do is I name the objects in my palette because when I name them it's a lot easier to identify what it is that I'm looking for on the layout. Uh, you know that right clicking on something lets you hide everything else and you know the right click gives you a number of things but naming the objects is important because if you have uh, several portals or lots of buttons you're looking at the objects in their stacking order and you're not really sure which one is which so if you take the time to give them a name uh, it's it's really better um, you also cannot put anything into a slide control or a tab control. You can put something into something that is in the slide control or the tab control, but the, the tab control itself only has as components the things that are on the tab layer. So uh, a common one that I have to deal with is a layout that has 34 slide control panels. And you know that if you go into layout mode when you're on panel number 25, you can work on panel number 25. But the moment you go into browse mode, it reverts back to number one. So if you want to be able to navigate quickly without having to go into browse mode and click, 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 click until you get to your desired one and then go into layout mode, if the portal, uh, excuse me, if the slide panels are named or numbered in a way that's recognizable to you, in layout mode you can just click on it and you'll be looking at that one right away. Oh, I meant to bring those up a little bit sooner. So the object names are visible to you even if they're not selected, which is handy. Um, and temporarily ungrouping and then regrouping, it can be confusing. So what I tend to do is hide everything else, do my ungroup and then regroup. Sometimes I'll copy the name so at least I have it on the clipboard so when I regroup it, I can put the name back again. Now, this is a tip that I have found really helpful. When there's something like, um, well, a tab control is a good example. If it is covering up other things, and you want to get it out of the way, not only in layout mode, but also in browse mode. And you don't want to assign a hide property to it. What I do is I open up the inspector, and whatever the left position is, I add 1,000 or 1,500. And that pushes it out into the space on the right. But it's a number that I can easily remember when it's time to bring it back. So in this example that you see on the screen, where, where it started at number one, all I did was add 1500 to it. And when I was done with whatever work I was doing in browse mode and satisfied that I now can have this thing come back, I just add or, or subtract 1500 from that number and it jumps right back into position. Conditional formats are wonderful. Um, they really bring your ordinary looking layout to life, uh, especially if they're intuitive and they correspond to something that people recognize. So in the example you see on the right, this is a pool service company in Fort Worth that names the service routes that their men work on by color. So they've got the black route, the blue route, the green route. It's just an easy way. So far they haven't run out of colors. But if I take any place in the database where the field for the route is used, I can have it automatically uh, conditionally formatted to display that color. Um, you can also use conditional formatting for the button icons, which is a relatively new thing that we got a few years ago. Um, we still can't use conditional formatting for gradients, and we can't use them for strokes. Um, I haven't looked for that in 19 yet to see if that's something that, that we're going to get, but it's a complaint that has been, especially strokes, is something that has been asked for. Uh, we don't have it yet. And of course, uh, conditional formatting overrides all of the formatting for any button. Right. It overrides the, you your custom the function. You don't press space or you press space or active space or that. 
Right. And the format painter fails to copy and paste anything that you did with a custom, uh, with a conditional format. Portal filtering is um, a place where your design work starts to use a little bit of your coding work. Um, you probably know that when you use portal filters, it eliminates a lot of unnecessary table occurrences. Uh, so that's a good reason to do it. Um, and sometimes a portal can be filtered with a calculation that you can make into a custom function, like I said before. Um, and you can do a lot with the same portal, putting it on layout after layout, if the only thing that's different about it is the filter. The filter can also be something that is sensitive to a value in a global field. So I know you know en enough about portal filters that I don't have to teach you how that's done, but I find it really a valuable way to make the, the layout uh, dynamic as the user is working with their own data. So this is one of my favorites. Design is a funny word. Some people think design means how it looks. If you dig deeper, it's really how it works. And if you're a fan of what Steve Jobs did, uh, not only in the very beginning with the Mac, but also later on, there's a consistency to his, his pursuit of uh, design. Um, everything that I've read or, or seen in film about the man uh, tells me that he's not the guy who wrote the code, but he knew what could be done by other people, and he was demanding about getting it done. Back in the days of the first Mac, these were the fonts that we had. Uh, they were all named after cities, and what made the Mac so spectacularly different in 1984 was that it even had a choice of fonts, because everything up until that point was a dark black screen with a green uh, character, and no choice whatsoever in what it looked like. Uh, Steve Jobs hired this lady named Susan Kerr to design the first icons for the original Mac. And um, that's what she's known for. You can read about her. Um, there was also a woman named Robin Williams who wrote a book called The Mac is Not a Typewriter, uh, which got a lot of traction back in those days. And of course, that was now 30 years ago. Uh, so a lot has changed. When Jobs passed away in 2011, he had already made his mark with iOS. And that's my segue into beginning to talk a little bit about iOS. It was a game changer in 2007. But remember that when iOS came out in 2007, it was only the iPhone and the only apps that we had on the iPhone were the ones that came with the iPhone. We were just making phone calls and playing with a few of the apps that were on the phone itself. It wasn't until two years later that, actually it was a year later with the second version of um, iOS that they, there became an app store. And that's when we started to get apps that were made by third party developers. And then it took another two years after 2007 before we got FileMaker Go. So when we got FileMaker Go, you might remember that it had a price. In the, in the early days, in the first version, we had FileMaker 11 on our computers. FileMaker Go was sold at $29 for the phone and $39 for the iPad. But as primitive as it was at that time, it was a signal for us as developers that our world had to change because it really made the design important. And that was something that our customers didn't demand before. But if you were gonna build something for iOS, for FileMaker Go, it had to compare in quality to what people were seeing in what they got from the App Store, most of the time as free downloads. So FileMaker Go has been free ever since 2012. And then in January of 2016, we got the iOS uh, app SDK. So it, it's been progressing. And of course, as you know, in the, we're someday in the near future, we're also gonna have the ability to work on Android. 
When FileMaker 12 was released, of course, that's when we went through the format change from FP7 to FMP12. But that's when this lady was hired from Adobe, and her work at FileMaker really, really made a difference. And a lot of it we're still seeing today. Uh, she told me at one point that there was no way that all the things that she wanted to introduce into FileMaker were going to manage to get in right away, that it would be years before some of them would show up. So for example, the layout objects palette is one of those examples. Um, it would have been nice to have it way back then, but what we got, thanks to Heather, was the influence of Adobe on design. Uh, we got an inspector, which we didn't have that up until then. Everything, if you remember, was off the menu. Um, we got themes and we got modal and floating windows and we got better charts. They're still not as great as things that other people uh, can do with a web viewer, but it was better than what we had before, which was nothing. Uh, we got gradients and guides and image slices and some much better starter examples than um, what we had before. One of the easiest things to see about iOS design was the round corners. I mean, if you picked up an iPhone or, or an iPad tablet, immediately you saw the rounded corners. This was one of Steve Jobs' um, really original, early, insistent things. And there's legends that you can read about on the web about his work with Bill Atkinson, who said it couldn't be done, and he forced him to do it. Uh, rounded corners really were an important part of uh, the Mac windows, and if you look at any Apple device that's on the market today, you'll always see rounded corners. So we now have rounding in our FileMaker work, uh, beginning with the tool in the inspector that lets us specify how much of a rounded corner we want on our fields or our layout objects. You can overdo it and make a mess of it. So it's really important with some of these inspector tools that we're gonna discuss now to be as subtle as you can be. The, it's always best if the person doesn't even perceive that it's there, if the work that you've done just looks naturally right. Here's an example of having, using round corners to make circular buttons. All you have to do is take the width of the object, let's say it's 30 points, and you make the rounded corners half of that, you've got a round field now, or a round button. I like to use the rounded corners for places where otherwise you would have to have a layout, um, um, what's the word, a field label. So if I've got a group of fields that are organized under a heading and I put a contrasting color above it with rounded corners, it makes for an attractive title. I also like to use them as uh, the column headers for portals or lists where it sits with a squared uh, corners on its bottom, but rounded corners on the top. And then you can do the same thing with the portal underneath it, where you make the corners square at the top and give them a little rounded edge if you need to at the bottom. Uh, when you use your button bars, you have to have the same radius on each corner. It doesn't allow you to say that you want the left side squared off and the right side to be curved. It's just an attribute of the way that button bars behave. Shadows and dim parent windows are great, but again, this is an example of not overdoing it. Uh, if your shadow is noticeable, it's probably too much. It should be so soft and subtle that the eye just perceives it as a natural shadow of something that's hit by light. If it's so prominent that you see the color and you see the definition, you've probably overdone it. When you get to the uh, dim parent windows, here's a window until uh, another window appears above it. And if the dimming occurs underneath it, obviously it brings the person's focus onto the object in the foreground. Be nice if our card windows could have rounded. Sorry? Be nice if our card windows could be rounded. Car windows? Card windows? Card windows. Like that. Um, well, that's not a card window. That's a new window that is a document that is 
or it could be a dialogue or it could be a document window, but it, it's not attached to one of the sides like a card window. So you can round those corners. Can you not? I think you're right, you can't. You can specify the size and the position of the window, but you cannot uh, alter its outside edges. See, the thing about gradients and shadows is they exist in nature. And your eye doesn't even see them. If you look at the walls of the room, there are gradients on them. There are shadows all around us. They're, when they're natural, you don't even realize they're there. If you're looking at, um, let's say, something on TV where there's a bright light on the speaker and you see the shadow behind the person's head, it's not properly done. A photographer will always put a backlight behind the person to avoid that. Um, if you take a photograph of somebody and then you want to silhouette the, the image of the person, sometimes you'll see there's a shadow behind the person because the flash of the camera has created it. But it's not natural for it to be that way. Padding is another one that you can overdo. Uh, but if it's not done at all, then you're missing a, a great point. You don't like padding? No, I hate you don't do padding. When, when padding is not done and the text is touching the edges of something, uh, it just doesn't look right. So padding is really important. It's a good substitute for the field at the bottom of the inspector where the first line can be indented a certain number of points. Uh, padding will be a substitute for using that. Um, with radio buttons, I use it a lot because I don't want the, the um, text of the radio button or the number to be visible. I just want the button. So with padding, I can force the text to be somewhere out to the right where the field boundary cuts it off. The problem with that is it doesn't work in WebDirect. Uh, you, the padding that you might put on a radio button does not work in WebDirect. WebDirect will always use a radio button that is the size of a pinhead, and if the radio button has any text associated with it, um, it's still going to show up right adjacent to the button. Good. That's a good reason not to use them, but if, if somebody doesn't know any better, that, that's what they experience. Um, I keep a, a list handy that I call access detectors. It's just a little chart that I have in a uh, JPEG on my desktop that helps me remember the platform numbers, the device numbers, uh, and how they correspond to each of the platforms that you're on, whether it's uh, an iPad or an iPhone or even Android and WebDirect. Um, the ones that are unreliable are what you see in the upper left, in the lower left corner. Those are the ones that pull down from your um, layout boundary, and, and they're called stencils. And the ones that FileMaker tells you uh, for desktop and iPhone and iPad, they're just not reliable. There's a much more extensive list that includes every variety of hiding and showing the menu bar, hiding and showing the toolbar, and how many pixels or points get added if you have it hidden or shown. Uh, before I found that chart that you're seeing there, I was using a little FileMaker database I created for myself. So I simply choose the device that I'm on and I see the eight varieties uh, with the numbers that are applying. So it's just easy to then go forward making your layouts. Another thing in iOS we have are these keyboards. Um, you can't memorize them. The names they've given to them don't even sound natural. Uh, like, if, it, if you say number and punctuation, you know, that could be any one of them. So what I did was I just made a screenshot of each of them, and I keep that handy so that when I'm applying a, um, a keyboard, option to a field that's going to be seen in iOS, I know what the user is going to see. The one that sometimes is forgotten is 
what happens with a value list in iOS. When you have a value list in FileMaker, of course, you're going to see the value list right underneath the field. In iOS, you're going to see that uh, casino style thing at the bottom of the screen. So you just have to be aware that that's what the user is going to see. Um, that little database, I should have said to you this to you in the beginning, there are a few tools that I'm going to bundle together with this keynote when I put it on the FMPUG um, site or, or database. So when you download the zip file, you'll have not only the keynote, but you'll have this little database of the, um, the keyboards and some of the other things that I've shown you. So now we get to themes. Sorry if it's out of order, Will. We could have done it before. Um, themes are wonderful, and Will is right. They take time to create them, but they pay back in time savings, and they give you the kind of consistency that would otherwise take a lot of time to change uh, if a particular style changed. But the style is specific to the theme. So if you have one theme in your database for your uh, FileMaker Pro desktop users, and another theme for your iOS users, the styles are not going to be uh, the same in both. You'll have to build the styles for each of them. I found a few years ago at DevCon uh, that there was this presentation by Bob Shockey, and he was showing this product called Stylo, which I thought was terrific. Um, it's one of those things that I came home from DevCon and promised myself I would do something with it and never did. But if I'm going to talk about styles, I want you to at least know that that guy is out there with a product. And whether he continued to make it and improve it or got rid of it, I really don't know. But it was a wonderful uh, tool for being able to organize your styles. Um, one of the things I find frustrating about styles is naming them because there's no particular naming convention that, that all of us have settled upon. So whatever thing you try to invent, it doesn't necessarily hold over time. Uh, we talked a little bit before about the hide attribute. Um, there are a number of ways that you can employ it. Uh, the example I'm showing you here was used when I wanted to hide certain things for people who speak English when the person who logs in is speaking Spanish or vice versa. Um, I think the hide f feature is the best new feature of the last decade. Um, it's just invaluable and what I used to do before it, I don't even remember how much work went into trying to make things hidden. I mentioned before that the, having something visible only to me with a custom function that I named DV for developer visible uh, is handy. And you know, Greg had his method of putting something in a popover. The popover itself is probably hidden from other people. Uh, placeholder text is a cool thing to play with too. You can actually put field values into placeholder text you can write calculations into your placeholder text. So, um, you, and you can, in, in one case here, I had language options as part of a calculation in the placeholder text. So that when somebody sees an empty field, they know what to do with. The thing to know about the placeholder text though is you can't do without a field label if the content of the field isn't self-evident. So for example, a phone number doesn't need a field label. Once the phone number is in the field, everybody knows it's a phone number. But there are other fields like first name that don't necessarily tell the person that it's a first name. So what you can do is you can have the field label hidden if the field is empty and use the placeholder to tell somebody what to type into it. And after the text is in there, if you feel that a label is necessary to identify what's in that field, then you can have it appear. Doing without the field labels is great because it saves a lot of space. That's where the placeholder texts, I think, have their best function. Um, so value lists, um, I'm going to show you a little bit about each kind. The edit box, you have the option for vertical scroll bars. And now, as of a few years ago, you can have that vertical scroll bar hidden unless the cursor rolls over it. Uh, in iOS, though, I think most of the time 
the fingertip rolling over it isn't necessary. You are swiping to scroll the thing, and that has the same effect. So you can do without scroll bars very naturally in your iOS layouts. When it comes to radio buttons, um, I just want to give you some caution about something that I've encountered, which is that there's a difference between sex and gender. Sex is a yes or no option. Gender is a male-female option. And these days, these radio buttons, believe it or not, have to include more than just male and female. Uh, I have one client who actually is using all five of those gender options. And the reason is they don't want to offend somebody who's filling out a form and might not feel comfortable one or the other. So we've got male, female, non-binary, trans, or undecided. And then for checkboxes, uh, we now have a, the ability to put a check instead of just the old X. A lot of us are now using icons that are taking the place of these little X and, and check if you can make something prettier uh, instead of the result of the checkbox. Uh, Pop-up menus, and a thing to note is if your value list is consisting of two fields, the first field being the one that is stored in the, in the record, the second field being the one that's displayed to the user. If you're using a pop-up menu, you've got to check that second box that has the peculiar heading override data formatting with value list. Whoever thought of that should be re-employed elsewhere. <laughs> what it means is if you want the second field to be visible, then you've got to have that box checked. And with drop-down lists, it's similar. Uh, but with drop-down lists, you've got the added benefit of being able to use autocomplete. And then with calendars, of course, you've got your calendar icon. But again, in iOS, people are not going to have a calendar icon. They're going to have a scrolling list of dates at the bottom of the screen, which is not really practical if the list begins with the current date and what you're asking somebody to put in is their date of birth. So what you end up having to do to make it user-friendly is have a separate field for the month and the date and the year. And then the value list is only 12 things for the month and 31 for the day. Concealed edit box, of course, is the one that gives you bullets instead of whatever text is in your character. I don't know, other than passwords, why else somebody would use that, but it's there if you need it. Oh, good. Social security. Thank you. This is something that I'm sure, Greg, you hear this a bit in your line of work. I used to get it all the time when you make a uh, an object graphic and people think, oh, it looks great. Why doesn't it look good on my website? Or why doesn't it look good on a brochure? Because of the resolution. Well, in FileMaker, the kind of questions we get are, uh, I hear people say that, well, I put something in, but it didn't stick. <laughs> what do you mean? It, it, there's, no, there's no glue. <laughs> How do I save something? We know that FileMaker doesn't require a save button. But people come to FileMaker from other worlds, and they think that there needs to be a save button. And sometimes they use these buzzwords in order to make themselves look smart, or because they think they know they want to impress you. Um, these are the instructions that FileMaker gave us for scalable vector graphics back in FileMaker 14. And if you want to take the time to read those, you've got more time on your hands, and it's not going to get you very far. So what I recommend for the scalable vector graphics is that you either subscribe to something like Noun Project, where you've got hundreds, maybe thousands of icons to choose from, or you can uh, follow what Alexis Allen has given the community about using Sketch on a Mac or InScape on Windows to draw some simple SVG graphics. Or if you're like me, you turn to Illustrator. So People complain that in Illustrator, it's difficult to do. So I'm going to show you how it's done. Suppose, for example, that you're working for Shell, and you want to have a button somewhere on a layout that uses the Shell logo. 
So the first thing you do in Illustrator is you take a graphic that you might have grabbed somewhere online from their website of that logo and you create a, a, um, an Illustrator file with a template layer. And what you're looking at there is the shell logo on a template layer. The template layer isn't something that prints and it's not something that you can modify. It's just like if you had a, ta um, a pad of tracing paper and you put the artwork underneath the top sheet of the tracing paper and then you took a pen and you went over it and you drew the thing. So in Illustrator what we do first is draw with a pen tool the right side of that object and because your eye tells you that that shell logo is actually symmetrical you can then flip what you've drawn on the right side and have it be mirrored over on the left side and then join the two points at the top and bottom. Then you can make a scaled down version of the outside object to create your inside object and then start drawing as if you were making a custom shaped scissor that would cut into it to create the, uh, the dividing parts of the shell logo and then that object can be flipped over horizontally also to create a mirror image of itself and joined and then you can put that object on top of the colored yellow thing you've drawn and apply the Pathfinder tool which behaves like a scissor and it cuts the top one out of the bottom one so what you end up with is this for the yellow one and then when you place that again on top of the original red one you have your finished shell logo. Now that's only half the project because now you have to save it as an SVG. So in Illustrator you give it a name and you save it as an SVG and you see that you're given all of these different SVG types that you don't understand but never mind just take the default one that's 1.1 and now you have an SVG file. So you go into FileMaker now and you want to import that as a button. So you click the little plus sign and you select your shell logo SVG and what do you get? You get a little white box with no logo in it. Okay. So the thing to know about Illustrator is that Illustrator files are text. Just like JSON is text and SQL is text and most computer languages are text. If you open an Illustrator file in text in a text editor like BB Edit, this is what you'll see. The reason you're seeing that plain white box without any logo is because it includes some things that you have to get rid of and it doesn't include some things that need to be there. So all of that code is the binary code that represents the image. We want to delete that. And I'm sorry that the slide isn't showing what it should, but there is a font problem there. Anyway, the point is when you, I'll make sure that when I distribute the file, whatever font was not shown in uh, BB Edit, I'll make sure that it's shown there. Basically, there's some text that you have to put into the header part. You get rid of all the graphic stuff at the bottom. I've shown it to you in yellow so that you can separate it from the white. And when you then save it, it works exactly the way you want it to work. Uh, tool tips are, are, have been around for a long time and what you've seen on the right is the sliding drawer example that I was talking about before. The sliding drawer consists of a slide control that has three components and when you slide over the icons in your button bar it uses a tool tip to make the sliding drawer show panel 2 or panel 3. Panel 1 has nothing in it. Um, the web address at the bottom of the slide for teamdf.com has all the instructions for how to make one of those. When you do it, 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 it's really smooth, users love it, it takes up very little space so all you need is a little icon in your button bar and whatever you want to bring out to the side it could be a sub menu or it could be uh, a display of text fields. If you work with the grids and the guide, you can do a better job of object alignment. But alignment is a really important thing. Um, your eye will notice right away when the objects are not aligned. So it may be something that you postpone toward the end of your layout work when you're really sure what's going to be there. Otherwise, you're going to move things around a lot, changing size and position. But if your objects are aligned properly, 
uh, your layout will look a whole lot better. And it, it's similar to padding in the sense that the lack of good object alignment indicates laziness to me. It means that somebody either didn't have the eye to detect that there was something wrong with that, or they just didn't have the time to do it or they were too lazy. When I was learning um, how to work in Quark Express, there was a guy in the shop who would always stand behind me and he'd look at my work over my shoulder and he'd say, aren't you going to kern that? And I'd turn around and I want to punch the guy and I'd say, Lenny, I'm going to kern that as soon as I get done learning how Quark Express works. It's not that I don't recognize that it needs to be done. And I think it's like that with padding. I look at somebody's work and I'll say, man, you really should pad that field or align those objects. Custom dialogues as opposed to new windows have pros and cons. I love custom dialogues because of the simplicity of inserting them into scripts to give the user three quick, easy options to do something without having to write the more lengthy scripts that you need when you cr use a new window. Uh, sometimes you have to use a new window when there's more than three options for the person. Um, the benefit of the new window, the main benefit is that you can specify the size and position of where you want it to appear. We still don't have that with custom, um, custom dialogues. We got the ability... Right, right. Uh, we, we got the ability a few years ago to modify our buttons and that they now commit all three and we got the ability to write custom text for our buttons and now we have variables as input fields which is handy. We still don't have the ability to determine where these dialogues go. And as you know, if somebody doesn't realize that they have to grab the corner of the thing to expand it, they may not see all the text that's in the button. So, you know, those are the benefits of uh, using Windows instead. They take a little bit more time to do. They, you have to make a layout that wasn't there before. Uh, you can sometimes get away with making one layout that's always used for your custom dialogues and just change the text that you put on it. Uh, Off-screen windows are a handy tip too, um, but the tip I want to give you about that is we used to send the window off to the right or off to the left. Beware of doing that now because somebody has two monitors, <laughs> they're going to see the thing. So go vertical with them and send them into space instead of sending them off to the side. But would it go, would, would, the, would the window go vertically? Yes. You can do negatives. Huh. Yeah. You can, but a negative number will work too, right? So you can send it down to your feet. Uh, oh, and you can, what I also sometimes do with a custom function is I will put my developer visible function into the custom window position so that if I'm the one who's running the script, it appears at zero, zero. So at least I can see what's going on until I'm certain. The last thing you want to have to do is force quit while you're doing your development work because you've got a window out there that is paused or not behaving properly. So at least while you're doing your development work, that window will be in a place where you can see it. Uh, tab order is something I hate. <laughs> Everybody hates having to do tab order, but we postpone it until the very end and then we have to kind of remind ourselves to go back and do it because the customer will express, yeah. right, well they'll remind you by requesting it, but they will request it early in the game and I always have to tell them if you're certain that everything on this layout is where it's supposed to be, I'm happy to do that now. But you don't want me charging you to go back and redo the tab order because you wanted to have something moved three inches left or right. Right. So look, if they're paying the bill, great. That's what we're here to do. But I try to postpone it until the end. Merge fields are a favorite of mine because they're so good at keeping your, your uh, print layouts um, 
organized properly is the best way I can say it. I hate having fields that are laid on top of one another and having to try so hard to make sure the baselines are aligned uh, or to have to use the tool in the inspector that says slide object left. Uh, and if the baseline isn't the same, it's not going to slide. So you end up going back to find these fields and make sure that they're in the right position so that they'll slide. If you make merge fields, you can have two fields or three or four or ten fields that are all separated by either a tab character or a space, but they're all in the one text object. And you can still apply um, the formatting of currency and decimals and things to it, even though it's a member of a bigger group. So in the example, I don't know if you can see it from there, I've got an examiner's name that's using a field value, a testing date that's using a global variable, and a date of report that's using an inserted um, placeholder. I think that's what they, what, is that what they're called? Uh, well, you know what they are. They come in with the curly brackets for page numbers and things like that. So you can use a field value, you can use a global, you can use an inserted symbol, and then when it's displayed, it looks perfectly natural. And when you're working in layout mode, you're not confused by you know, what thing is stacked on top of something else. And it's perfectly okay to stretch the boundaries of that merge field way out to the right into the uh, scratch area because it's going to be ignored when, when the, the field name might be long, but the actual field value might be short. So when it's displayed back in browse or print or preview, you don't care about what's hanging out in, to the right. Um, I use these a lot for tab stop headers, but you can't do it in WebDirect. In WebDirect, if you want to have headings over columns of, let's say, a report or a portal, you have to make separate objects because the web direct technology ignores the tab stops. So they'll just all be strung together to the left. But in FileMaker Pro um, or FileMaker Go, they're wonderful. And the reason I like them again is because my horizontal alignment is the same. If I need to change the font on any of them or the size, one keystroke and the whole header object is changed. So the way to get there, unfortunately, is a mess. Um, I had a, a community thread on this just a few days ago where some of the people who I respect in the community were asking me, how do you do this? I didn't, I've really not paid attention to this for years. Well, you have to start with line spacing, and then in line spacing, in the lower left corner, you'll see the button for tabs. And then in tabs, you see something similar to what you have in the very bottom of the inspector. So you can then use this tool in order to apply, uh, in, in this case it's the result of a virtual list array where everything is just scattered at first because the tab stops don't exist. But when you put the tab stops in, you get a very nice columnar display. So I use this a lot for a virtual list where I don't want to make a layout and a portal. I just want to take all the text that comes out of that virtual list and arrange it for viewing. So there's another example of the same thing. Execute SQL gives you your, your array. Then you set the field with that value. You don't have to have any tables. You don't have to have any portals. We're getting towards the end. Reports is something that I remember calling Will one day on the phone and saying, what should I show people about reports? What is there? I can't even think of anything. And then when I put my mind to it, I thought, well, there really is a lot you can do with reports because re reports are not just things that are on paper. Reporting out of FileMaker can be done a variety of ways. So one way that you can do it is inside FileMaker to just show people uh, a, a particular list of things to your reporting out. You can export that to Excel. You can also export uh, as a snapshot link. Very handy sometimes, a good example I give people is a bookkeeper's working with some past due accounts. It's five o'clock, it's time to go home. She wants to start the next day with the same set of records that she was just finished with. So if she saves a snapshot link, then the next morning she can just hit that snapshot link and it'll bring her back to that layout with that found set in that exact sort order.
as long as the records haven't been deleted by someone else you know, overnight. You can save records as PDFs, obviously. It's another way of reporting. And you can print to paper. And you can print with multiple columns if you feel that you want to save paper. So some lists can be abbreviated, so we're all conscious these days of wasting paper. Or you can do dashboard reporting where a whole bunch of information can be seen by executives. Uh, this is one that at first glance it looks like it's very busy, uh, but what it gives the owner of that company at a glance are some things that he can click a button to see, and I've superimposed those, and other things that are just always present. So for example there, they click the green button and it shows them today's weather report in a web viewer. Paul talked about color at a meeting last fall, so I'm not going to go too much into color, just to remind you that FileMaker has some good tools to help you work with color. Uh, and the, what was called color moods on the previous slide, we have in that thing at the top of our color picker now. Uh, Adobe has some wonderful color uh, tools to help you choose the colors that are coordinated well with one another. Uh, this is something online at W3 Schools, which is an HTML color mixer. I love base elements. It's not really a part of my design work, but um, at the last DevCon, they introduced something that had to do with styles. I haven't used it. I kick myself, I should have used it before today's meeting so I could tell you about it. But what it basically does is allow you to copy something out of the base elements uh, XML and paste it back into your layout in order to update all of your styles and themes. So I would suggest if that appeals to you, uh, check out what's on the base elements website. They probably have some examples there of how it's used. Of course, with base elements, you also get a lot of other things like error reporting that's handy. You can't depend on your eyes when your imagination is out of focus. A typical Mark Twain remark. The last part of what I'm showing you today is sort of esoteric. Um, I call this object weight. If you want your layouts to look good, one of the things that you can do is to try to visually assess, is it pulling toward one side or another? Does it seem to be weighted to the top too much? Or is it nicely balanced? Um, when you work through this keynote, you'll see this uh, discussion of a, what's called a structural skeleton. And if you take your iPad and lock the rotation, you can take the iPad and turn it upside down. And it'll show you immediately whether things are balanced. This is what we used to do with um, graphic design work for brochures or ads to make sure that they didn't have that pull in one direction or another. On your computer, you can go to your display's preference and you can flip it to 180 degrees and look at it that way. Or you can just use an iPad and keep it handy to check it. Negative space is similar to that. This is where I give praise to Will for his layout work because there's lots of negative space there, which helps to focus the eye on what is important. So some examples of negative space are the NBC Peacock, or this one that you've probably seen for years where you either see two faces or you see a vase. But here's an example of color being used to create balance. The gray object is equally heavy to the black one, even though it's twice as big, because our eye perceives the negative space around it. And finally, to reinforce this thing about uh, balance, I'm showing you some brochures and what they look like if you flip them over. They're kind of balanced, just like they were. And you, the, the thing about upside down is your brain doesn't read the words. So things look kind of balanced. This one seems to tend to be a little bit heavier at the bottom. But when it's a web page, that weight is at the top where you sort of expect it. 
Uh, and finally, this is what I'm calling unusual style behavior that I've experienced working in the ETS version of FileMaker 19. In 18, this is what the fields looked like in browse mode. In 19, for some reason, they showed up that way. And what I found to correct it was that if I took the line weight of one point and changed it from solid to none, it fixed it. Similarly, in layout mode, the same thing was happening. And in layout mode, I found that the fix was that if I took the, um, the blur of zero and changed it to a blur of one, for some reason, that made it go away. So I'm doing my job as a good citizen of reporting things. Uh, hopefully, when we get the real product, that won't be there. But those are the kind of surprises that you sometimes get. If I have to do this, I'm going to blame you. OK. <laughs> and finally, consistency. Um, I won't read all these to you, but there are seven tips about consistency that are at that URL. The first one is about dominant and secondary colors, uh, type sizes, spacing and position, the size and relationship of various elements, uh, how to use space effectively, uh, visuals that cross different mediums, and by that you want to make sure that the visuals in FileMaker correspond to what might be in their brochures or on their website, so there's consistency there. Um, patterns that work together naturally, and finally, elements that stick, and by that they're talking about things that people will retain visually. Um, it's good reading, it doesn't take long, and that's why I gave you the URL um, to have a look at those things. It's a similar idea to sticky navigation in FileMaker because we are going back and forth. We don't have a back button in FileMaker like we do in web browsers. And finally, this quote from Nolan Bushnell, the ultimate inspiration is the deadline. So that is the end. You have some closing remarks? Do you? Well, I had a, we're providing the mic to. Okay, the uh, last minute questions of Dennis here. Okay, great. The alternate. Oh, oh, alternate. Right, right, right. Alternate rows. Um, I use them sparingly. I have to make sure that all the fields are transparent. I make the fields actually just different colors, but all transparent. I've tried using the the mod function to determine which rows are even and odd and use that in order to color the background of the field to be the same as the darker row. The hard part is that you have an easy time specifying the color of the field, whether you choose RGB or the hex value. How do you find the color of the alternating row? It's, n it's nowhere to be seen. The inspector, yeah, it'll, it'll, you can choose the alternate thing, but, but you can't determine what is the color value. You can't determine what it is programmatic. Right. Well, basically, I just, I just use like varying colors. They're nice. It's another good example of subtlety being better than extreme differences. Of course, the file maker still has its issues with that. Another thing that goes with that is that some people don't realize that in order to get the number of a portal row, get record number does it. Right. So the other thing I brought up, um, and I'm not sure if we touched too much on this, um, is I know everybody here has kind of 
grown up in FileMaker using tab interfaces, but I've completely moved off of that and gone to button bars and slide panels. And I didn't know if that was something that uh, you wanted to weigh in on. Well, an example of what I love about button bars is that you've got a layout and everything's great and now they want to add something and you don't want to have to do what was in the very beginning of my presentation where you start making the layout bigger and it's very easy if you've got a drop down menu of options that can handle that thing maybe it's a report or maybe it's a go to somewhere else Yes. You have a form layout, you put a found set portal on it, and now you can control the width of the, the, uh, the list, the ballistic, what I call ballistic. And when you do that, then you find space over on the left and the right, like you do in a web page, to extend the menus, and you don't have the problem that you, you want to solve. I, I agree with you about that problem. When you've got everything nice, and the you know, client says, I need to add something. Well, if you're making your, your lists as links, yeah, I didn't get into popovers at all, but popovers are another way to avoid a layout getting overcrowded. If you can consolidate a few things that are seldom looked at and just make them available at a click. I think it's working. I think your comment was correct. Yes, it's uh, very uh, nice to be able to control that uh, font size and script, uh, script workspace and be more than a lot like I do. So anyway, that would be exciting. When, okay. I, when I saw the larger font size and script workspace the day before yesterday in the ETS, the latest ETS version, um, my first reaction was I won't have to wipe those nose prints off my monitor anymore. <laughs> Okay, well next month hopefully we're going to have Claire's Connect and probably very soon that uh, final product, so uh, plan to be here next month, and uh, I'll meet myself and Michael Wallace will be doing that, and we're looking forward to that, and Paul, do you have anything to uh, learn so much? And as always, next Friday, February 14th, we're going to talk about how much we love the file maker, but we can't talk about Claire's Connect, because they have to go on that. Uh, so our public break for us next week at our bottom office. We don't yet know what we're replacing that with, so, but we're still buying lunch. So it's got to be a surprise. <laughs> I expect to be. <laughs> Pretty much. Good deal. <laughs> okay, well, we hope to see you guys next month, and happy following. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you.